We are now rolling. What similarities are there between the story of the tobacco industry and the story of cell phones and wireless radiation? Well, it's a very good question because, in fact, uh, in the 1980s, I was at the National Academy of Sciences where there was a debate. Do we have enough evidence, do we have any evidence, that exposure to tobacco smoke is harmful to children? After all, they're not smokers. Why should it matter? And at that time, uh, it was a serious scientific debate. Well, I think we face the same situation today with respect to wireless radiation and health in that there seems to be a debate on the question. But if you look seriously at the data that we now have, there's no debate. We know that cell phone radiation is dangerous. Uh, we've known it for years. And some in industry have known it for a lot longer than most of us. So I think that the similarities are that there was a major suppression of science in the tobacco industry in the 1950s through the 1980s. And that only ended with the release of the tobacco papers, which were dropped on the desk of a Professor Stanton Glantz at the University of California, San Francisco, that to disclose how much data the industry had for so long on tobacco to show there were dangers. And I think we face a very similar situation today where some in industry have known for some time that you would never want to have a cell phone directly next to your body or certainly not use it as a toy for children. Should we assume that all cell phones are properly tested for safety before we're allowed to purchase them and that if there were any risk to the public from wireless radiation that we would be told? Unfortunately, no. Uh, we know from data that have recently been released from the Chicago Tribune, from the French government, which I'm going to be talking about, we know that when cell phones are tested directly next to the body, they exceed the current radiation limits which are 23 years old, which should not take into account the fact that cell phone radiation damages sperm, increases the risk of cancer, damages the nervous system. We know all of that. So no, phones are not adequately tested for safety. And I have long said that if phones were a drug, they would be illegal. By that I mean they've never gone through safety testing. We test every drug that we take is tested first in animals and then carefully monitored when people are first exposed. There's no monitoring going on right now for the adverse effects of cell phones. And I'm going to be dedicating my talk today to two women. One is Maria Auguste, who died at age 30, unable to find a safe place to live because of her sensitivity to radiation. The other is Callie Pavano, a young woman who was a runner. She's alive, but barely. Uh, she's suffering gravely from cancer that she developed from having kept her laptop right over her left thigh for many, many years. And she first noticed the problem of pain in her thigh because she was a runner. She was a very healthy young woman who had no idea that she was putting microwave radiation into her body. So no, these devices, cell phones as well as laptops, are not tested the way they're used. And in fact, you'll notice they don't call them laptops anymore. They call them tablets because they belong on tables and they're tested 20 centimeters off of an adult male body. They're never tested for the little children that are using them in schools around the world today. What is 5G? Where is it? How does it affect me and my family? Are there any studies talking about the health effects of it? 5G refers to the next generation of wireless technology. We've had 2G, 3G, 4G. Mostly at this point, it's a marketing device. It's a marketing device. The Australian government has recently issued a notice. There are no instruments for testing the 5G frequencies. It refers, <clears throat> 5G refers to the speed at which transmission can take place. So 5G, where it will exist, mostly in football stadiums at this point, can be faster than the other systems. However, in order to bring 5G to you, to your home, it will need to have an antenna with 5G capacity in it that also includes 3G and 4G. So we're taking the signals that have previously been kept generally far away on mountaintops or tall on buildings and bringing them to within a few hundred yards of your home, actually 100 yards or less, 
perhaps at your bedroom window. And that FCC rules have recently been written to allow that the 5G antennas, will, which will include 3G and 4G signals in them, can be placed closer to human beings than ever before. They've not been tested for safety. What data we have on them comes very interestingly from studies from a group of researchers affiliated with the Swiss and French national research teams, and they have shown that damage occurs to honeybees from 5G signals. And the higher the frequency of the 5G, the greater the absorption into the body of these honeybees. Honeybees, they're critical for agriculture. Without them, we won't be able to produce food. And they are raising the alarms about this, and these are scientists who have worked with industry for years who are very concerned about what this might mean. So we do not have standards for what 5G is. We don't have a way to test or monitor it. And we do have some safety data. We know that it can accelerate the growth of bacteria. We know that it can accelerate the growth of viruses. We know that it can accelerate the growth of cancer cells. Now, why would we be exposing ourselves to this in greater amounts without stipulating limitations? Now, we at Environmental Health Trust believe you can have safe G by stipulating that the fiber optic cable that is the backbone for all of these things be wired to and through the premises. Wire to and through the premises, which means if you're a bank, a police or fire department or hospital, and you want the faster speed, you wire it to and into and through your premise. So you can hook up by plugging in, getting a faster speed, which is safer. safer. So it will be faster, safer, and much more secure from hacking. And that's what we think is the way to go for new technology. We're not anti-technology. We just want to make it as safe as possible. And that means that we do not expose <clears throat> billions of children and the rest of us to this untested radiation, that we make 5G wired so that we actually do not need the wireless component. Uh, let me explain, because it gets to be confusing very fast. Phones today, the phone voice part of the phone, is operating on 4G or 4G LTE. That's a frequency of about 2.4 billion cycles a second. 5G will operate at 5 billion up to 100 billion cycles a second. There are no 5G phones. The 5G voice activation in the phone uh, doesn't exist. Phones will always be using 4G LTE for the next 10 years, according to industry engineers. What 5G does is allows you to download to your wristwatch or your cell phone a movie, a game, or pornography so that you can get it in seconds as opposed to minutes. That's what it does. It gives you a faster speed for videos and games. It does not give you safer or better voice connection. So to call it a 5G phone is a misnomer. It has 5G capacity for video, for photos, but not for voice. It works in the NFL stadiums now. And if you go to some of these major stadiums, you cannot escape it. But there's no data on its safety. And there's lots of reasons for concern about it, including that raised by Israeli physicists, radiation experts, who say that the capacity of non-ionizing radiation to damage DNA is very much like the capacity of x-rays to damage DNA. Ionizing and non-ionizing radiation are different, but they both can damage DNA. DNA is the basic building block of all living cells, whether plants or animals or us. And our DNA is at, at risk from exposure to 5G radiation. Why have over 200 scientists called for a moratorium on the rollout of 5G? Well, I'm one of the 240 scientists that have called for a moratorium on the rollout of 5G because we have concluded that there are not adequate safety data. Look, the question is this. Do you want to take experiments on animals, which we have some of, and regard them as a prediction of human effects in order to prevent human harm? Or do you want to say, wait, we need to prove human harm first. 
if we take that position, we're basically treating ourselves and our children like lab rats in an experiment with no controls. How can individual people do something to stop the rollout of 5G on their own, uh, in their own town, their city, or state? What are 4G and 5G streamlining bills? Unfortunately, at the federal level, a law was passed that basically removes any control from local authorities. The federal government can, can come in and with the providers say, we want an antenna here and here and here, and you as an individual have no say. What we're doing in Environmental Health Trust now is organizing a major lawsuit against this law. And we have grounds of violation of the Administrative Procedure Act and the National Environmental Policy Act, both of which have been ignored by the FCC when it recently issued a new order saying, we have concluded that despite 23 years of new data on the science, we're not going to change our approach to evaluating wireless radiation for phones or anything else, including, by the way, 5G, which didn't even exist 23 years ago when these standards were set. So we at Environmental Health Trust are organizing a major legal challenge to this, led by senior litigators formerly with the Justice Department, the Department of Energy, and working also with the Natural Resources Defense Council. We are raising, right now, we have to raise $50,000 more, and we're quite optimistic we're going to succeed in doing that uh, at the website ehtrust.org because we know that that's the only thing we can do right now is to challenge the federal law, which does say you as an individual, you as a town, have no say so over where the antenna is located, nor how much money you can get for having it, it posted right on a street lamp or public utility poles. So basically, this law says the industry can come and they can use publicly funded resources, namely telephone poles and utility poles, and they can put the antennas on them, and you don't get any increase in revenue for it beyond $250 a year. Does my local town have the right to say no to 5G, or is it a national thing? Your local town can and should join with 100 cities that are now in a lawsuit that's being reviewed at the Ninth Circuit on the West Coast that is saying, we object to this heavy-handed federal government law that has just been passed. That's one thing your city can do. The other thing they can do is they can stipulate that any antenna that is applied, that is built, must be monitored for its emissions. And there's the kicker. There's no known technology for monitoring for this. They haven't even agreed on what the 5G standard is at this point. So they want to build it first and then figure out how it's going to work. And we're going to be the guinea pigs in that experiment. Your book, The Secret History of the War on Cancer, which is an incredible read about how leading scientists knew in the 1930s that radiation and chemicals and pesticides were harmful to our health, but because of money and industry power and things that happened in World War II, a lot that got buried, uh, we're focusing on treatment rather than prevention. How would you compare this story to the story of cell phones and wireless radiation today? Unfortunately, there are some very important parallels between what happened in the 1930s with respect to pesticides, radiation, chemicals, and tobacco. And that is the following. In the 1930s, as an example, in Argentina, there was a very important institute for the study of tobacco in the 1930s. And it got completely forgotten in the run-up to World War II. Also, there was no internet back then. So it was very hard to find and share information. People had to go actually talk to one another. What an amazing idea. We don't do that anymore. There are some many advantages of the electronification of communication. There are, no question about it. But one of the disadvantages, though, is it's rather easy to ignore things. If it doesn't exist on the internet, maybe it's, it's not considered to be real to many people. And so as a consequence, we face a situation where it, there is the capacity of the large search engines to overlook, shall we say, suppress science that is inconvenient. And we have a lot of inconvenient science here, a lot of inconvenient science showing that there are dangers from wireless radiation. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, 
concluded in 2011, which is almost 10 years ago, that there was enough evidence at that time to say that cell phone radiation was a possible human carcinogen. Since then, a number of scientists associated with the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or scientists like Dr. James Lynn associated with the IEEE, the electrical engineer experts that give advice, have all said, wait a minute, we've got a lot more science now. This is a human carcinogen. Is it accurate that insurance companies have refused to cover mobile operators for years now because of the risk being so high? Can you explain that in more detail? Well, think about what insurance companies do. They're basically handicappers. They look at the risk and they decide, well, we're going to invest in this one because it's very low risk and we're going to stay away from those. Well, <clears throat> since 1997, some of the participants in Lloyd's of London have refused to cover any health damages from electromagnetic fields since 1997. Most recently, Swiss Re issued a white paper in which they referred to 5G as potentially the next asbestos. They said literally, using a British term, it will be off the leash, meaning out of control. And for that reason, the large telecom companies are all self-insured. And with this multi-trillion dollar industry, they can afford to be self-insured. There are lawsuits now that will ultimately be won by people who have suffered brain tumors, many of them dead, because of their cell phone use. And even though the industry will have to pay billions, it will not affect them at all. You recently said that the safety standards to, for our phones today are based on tests that were developed 20 years ago and that they were developed for military and medical uses for people who didn't speak too much, six minutes. Can you explain that in more detail? The standard for testing cell phones today is based on, first, a rather large head of a fellow more than six feet tall, weighing well over 200 pounds, who spoke for six minutes. And the test was, how hot did his brain get during that call? That was the sole test for every one of the world's 7 billion phones in operation today. It still is. Yet we know from the Cleveland Clinic and all infertility clinics for men around the world, that the first thing the doctors say to a man who's having trouble getting his wife pregnant is please take your phone off your body and out of your pocket. Because the more time you spend with your phone or other device close to your body, the lower your sperm count is going to be. In chapter three of Disconnect, what did you mean by the war that started it all? Well, the whole development of microwave technology took place uh, in World War II, and it's a good thing for us that it did. Because with microwave, which is, uh, allows you the, the base of radar, you could detect flying things in the air in time to avoid them. And the magnetron was developed, uh, originally developed in England, but manufactured in the United States, and was transported over to the United States under highly secret circumstances in a boat Imagine if that boat had been sunk during the war. And once we had the technology to develop the magnetron, that led to the development of radar, and that allowed England to predict and therefore to avoid the German aircraft that were then bombing the hell out of England. Can you sum up in 15 seconds everything we talked about here today? Wireless radiation is bad for your health. We know that now. Some people are very sensitive to it, like Maria August. Other people suffer from cancer as a result of it, like Kali Pivano. We should stop making people into the guinea pigs to prove that it's dangerous and start to pay attention. It's far better to prevent harm than to prove it exists. What's the one thing I must do today? Talk to your children. Talk to your family so that they know that a cell phone is a two-way microwave radio. And I believe that we should stop giving phones to children except for emergency uses under limited circumstances. And we need to rethink the way we use wireless radiation in our homes. Wired connections, whether for your laptop or your phone, are always going to be safer and more secure. Use your cell phone like an answering machine. Know that when the signal is weak, the phone is going to work harder because it's smart. It's going to put more radiation into you and into the environment. And your battery 
will drain. So think of it this way. If your battery is draining out faster, it's draining into you. It's a bad circumstance. Phones have changed our lives a lot for the better, but we have to be smart about how we use them. Why did you feel it was important to come here to the Real Truth About Health conference and speak? Because everyone listening to me today is connected to people they care about. Because people who pay attention to this meeting are people who already are concerned about their health. And they understand that while there are things you cannot control, you don't get to pick your parents, the majority of our health is determined by the way we interact with the environment, broadly conceived. And this is an avoidable environmental hazard that we need to understand and do something about. For people that want to learn more about your work, where should they go? Please look at our website, ehtrust.org. Go to our Facebook page and like us. And follow us on Twitter at Safer Phones. And share information. We've got these safety cards in Spanish and English that warn women not to put phones in their bra. We have information for men as well about how to avoid uh, and why to avoid keeping phones in the pocket, whether they're concerned about pregnancy or simply sexual function. And we've got materials for parents of young children to be shared with their teachers, superintendents, with information from the American Academy of Pediatrics about how to use cell phones always on speaker mode or with a wired headset. And finally, we have new information on 5G and your health and why you need to protect yourself and why if you do that, your brain will work better, your mood will be more elevated. Sleep in the dark and understand that you need to protect yourself and you need to practice safe tech.